I'm Martin. I, I do speak a few languages, including Privet, Minisvati, Martin. Как дела? All right. The rest of the talk is going to be in English, though, because my Russian, я очень плохо говорю по-русски и украински. So, um, I'm a Google developer advocate at, well, the Google office in Zurich, and I work with the team that is called the Webmasters Trends Analysts Team. If that doesn't mean much to you, that's fine. You're going to learn about what I'm concerned with in a second. So let's have a look at what we're going to do, and it's not that much time, so we're going to go right into it. Basically, I want to talk about um, a tale of a website. So I had a few things lying around, and I thought, well, maybe make a website out of it and get rich quick. It didn't really work. I'm still not having a yacht or like living on a Caribbean island. So hey, here am I talking about a website. And then we want to talk about how to make it better using Angular and make it more modern and make it more man manageable because the, the code originally was not necessarily maintainable or scalable. And Angular is one way of doing that uh, in a better way. But then once I did that, I found something was off. And I want to share this discovery with you that surprised me back there so that you don't have this bad surprise as well. And uh, last but not least, we then go back to the basics to then ramp up into universal advice using Angular Universal. All right, so let's start with the tale of a website. So I have a bunch of images on my computer um, that are cute puppies and uh, doggers, and you know, dogs and puppers are so cute, and I'll just, oh God, I love it. It makes me happy, and they look wonderful, and you see them in the morning, you're like, ah, oh, the day starts in a very great way, so hey, off we go into the adventure of whatever brings today. And if you have a bad day, you just look at them and you're like, ah. So I think I should share this joy with the world. So as a web developer, what do I obviously do? I make a website, right? That's the obvious thing to do. So I might start like this, write some HTML, put some you know images in and put some links for detail pages. And then I might even use some JavaScript to pull the content from an API and um, once I have it pulled from the API, I'm going to display it dynamically and we'll be fine, right? The markup's more or less going to look like this. And whoops, what is going on with the clicker? And then we get an experience like this. This is on a 3G, slow 3G connection. But hey, we get to the poppers and we can scroll through them and we can even tap on them and see like more details. So we are having a pretty good experience, but you know, maybe we can optimize a little more. So let's have a look at performance here. And as we can see, this, this website is actually doing pretty fine if you look at just the numbers, right? We get a performance 100, we get accessibility 100, that's fantastic, that's what you want to do really. We get best, best practices 87 because I couldn't be bothered to actually use H2, so we are using HTTPS, but that's still good enough, I guess. But if we look closer to the numbers, it's actually, it's actually better than you might expect originally. On a 2G or 3G connection, we still get our first content full paint after 0 0.8 seconds. 0 0.8 seconds, that I think is pretty fine to like get some content on there. Uh, the first meaningful paint takes a little um, longer, basically not longer any at all, really. So that, like we get all the content there really quickly and we'll have a good time. Fantastic. But if we look at the, at the videos uh, or the, the photo stream for that, so we see like, okay, we get a bunch of nothing here, only for two frames. And then we already like start building up the application that loads a while because we're going to the network here, but then we have the dogs there and our users are happy. Fantastic. So that's going to mean that what's happening here with my slides? Oh, whatever. That's going to mean we're, we're going to be fine, but the code is pretty messy and I do not really want to put this online yet. I want to make it more modern. I want to make it nicer. I want to give the user nice transitions when they click on the individual puppies on, and doggos. So what I want to do is I want to build a single page app and I'll use, <laughs> the clicker is fun. I'm going to use Angular for that because you know, it's one of the many frameworks that I could have chosen, um, but I think it's one that is really well when it comes to scaling an application. Maybe I want to build like the dog Imperium online. So I might have a lot of pages and I might have like a gigantic team of developers working on it every day. And I want to make sure that I have all the type annotations and all the niceties of Angular. So. This is actually pretty nice because I just install the Angular CLI and then I can go ng new and then I create my project and then I can actually have my development server run and I build the application. And once I'm done building it, I can just package it up 
for deployment in a production environment, and then I just deploy it somewhere, and then I'll be happy. So what's then gonna happen is, um, we're gonna have a look at how we're doing. So now I build all of this, and I, I optimize it for production, and I deploy it somewhere, and I'm getting still pretty good numbers. I mean, we're not having 100 anymore, we have 95, but come on, what's five points? Whatever, it's gonna be fine. Accessibility is still going well, uh, best practices is also all right. Okay, let's have a closer look at the performance numbers here. Hmm. Now these numbers have changed a little bit, don't they? We have 1.3 uh, sorry, 1.3 seconds until we get the first content full paint, and actually a lot more time than the initial 800 milliseconds for the first meaningful paint. So we do a bunch of more stuff to get the content on the screen. But what does that mean for the user? Well, I think it's it's worthy having a look at what that means by looking at the frame stream here as well. So this is more or less the same thing, right? We're having nothing for two frames. That's just because the network has to fetch our stuff and we are not using any caches, so this is the first visit. This is gonna get better once we have stuff in the cache. Looks more or less the same. Now here we have some design changes, but it's still pretty much like you know loading spinners, loading spinners, loading spinners, loading spinners. This is interesting. We get the first image quicker. That's good but then it takes longer to load the rest for some reason, so um, that might just be jitter, so we don't worry too much. So now that we have a fast app, we are basically done, right? I can just put some ads on it, and then I'll be rich. I don't have to do anything. But unfortunately, looking at the data, revealed not so nice numbers. Oh, bum. No page views, no time spent on my page. No one's gonna put ads on my page and I'm not gonna make money from this. Even if I don't like ads, I might just sell subscriptions, but I'm not getting even any visitors. So if I don't have any free users, then I'm not gonna get paid users either. So this this was a surprise because I'm like, wait a minute. I mean, I just put a website online and, and you know, people should be coming to it and just clicking on it. So that raises the question, how do people find new websites? Well, maybe, just maybe, with a search engine. I hear that this web startup uh, from the Silicon Valley does a pretty good job, I don't know. So, this was my surprise. I'm like, okay, so I built my thing and I put it out there and no one's finding it, no one's seeing it, no one gets to it. Why, why is that? What's happening here? What's going on? So if I type in, what does Google know about my wonderful website? I get this response. And this response is worrying because it tells me that Google doesn't know about it. Google just goes like, whatever you're looking for, I have nothing. I, I don't have anything for you. And that was weird, wasn't it? I'm like, oh, wait, but my website is there. So why don't you find it? I mean, you're a search engine. You should find my stuff. So why is it, why is it not happening? And I'm like, what have I done? Did I upset them? Did I say something wrong? Did I wear the wrong shoes? I don't know. What what do I have to sacrifice a chicken or something? What do I have to do to make this happen? Well, let's go back to the basics. Let's start from zero, basically. If we have a look at a search result, what's the clicker doing? Is there? Yeah, good. If we have a look at search results, we see that they have a certain structure. So which of these is the best for me? As a, as a user, if I type something in, I want to find the best search result, which is not necessarily the first one, but one of the first ones probably, uh, if, if Google ranking does its, its job. So how can, I, how can I inform myself of what might be the best search result for what I'm looking for? Well, first things first, we have a title that hopefully tells me what this page actually is about. If all of these would be dogs, then I wouldn't know which one might be the best one. So the first one gives me 40 of them, that's fantastic. The second one gives me some Twitter account, which might be good, might not be good. What if it's a Twitter account that has like three dogs on it? That's not really good. So I get 40 in the first one, that's fantastic. I get 21 in the last one, and in the middle one I don't actually know if it's any good, so I think like the first one might be good. I also get a little bit of an additional description on it, and I get a date that tells me when this information was, was found by Google. So I see like, okay, there's uh, not, just, just not just any 40 dogs, there are 40 of the cutest dogs alive. Alive is important because that means I can probably meet them and pet them, which is fantastic. Right, so 
basically we have two ingredients here. We have a title and we have a description that helps me as a user identify which search result I care about or which search result might be helping me with what I'm trying to accomplish. In this case, look at cute puppies. So here I get 40 cute puppies um, and they are hopefully alive and uh, that's great. So let's add titles and descriptions to our pages. So we have basically two kinds of pages. We have the overview page that is pretty generic, but then we have the page for the individual doggos. All right, so here's how we can do that in Angular. And it's actually not very hard. I'm really happy how easy they make it. So you basically just get the title and meta service from the platform browser module that Angular comes with and get a reference to them in the constructor. And last but not least, somewhere in your component, when the component gets ready, you're using their set title and the add tag description um, to actually put the content description and the title in. And that's pretty much it. That's all the magic. So like these, whoops, what's happening with the clicker? These lines, the last two lines are the most important ones where we are actually setting the, the title and description. But it's still not showing up. <sighs> what have I done? So the good thing is we can debug this. We are developers. We can debug this. We'll be fine. All right, let's do so. So a great first stop for our debugging journey is the mobile friendly test. What does it do? Well, it's in the name. It tests if our page is mobile friendly. To be honest, at this point, it's not that important to me if my page is mobile friendly because it doesn't show up in Google at all. But it's, it's good to see that apparently we are doing fine. Our page is mobile friendly. Yay, that's great. That's fantastic. That's a good first stop. More importantly, it also shows us what Google sees when they come to our page. And they see that. Well, that's a surprise. Huh. So why is that? Is there like, was there something that wasn't loaded? Well, it says all of the things have been loaded, all resources have been available, it's fine, you're good. So that's not really helping. So what else could it be? Hmm. Maybe, maybe there's some, some JavaScript problems. And look at that. Can you see that? It says uncaught type error, undefined is not a function. Okay, um, but the good thing is I can debug this. I now have a way to debug this. I can use ngrok or something to expose my local server to the internet, and then I can like rerun these tests until I have fixed my problems. And that is amazing because this is basically our debug tool to figure out how Google search or the, the Google bot actually sees my pages. So then I do them some, some work and then, um, then we are done. So I, I do my investigation, I fix the issue, and then I'm done. Luckily, you don't have to do that because Angular does that for you. So like they fix these problems. So if you just run a new Angular app, you'll be mostly fine. But we can do more than just that. And for that, I'd like to look at a few more broader things. So we're going to have a look at universal advice, not necessarily only for Angular, for any of your websites, really. So let's start with figuring out how does Googlebot actually work. Googlebot is the thing that we run that goes through all the internet pages and we try to figure out what they are about and put them into Google search so that people can find them, which is important because you know we want our, our stuff to be used by someone so they have to be able to find it as well. So first step first is we go crawling. Crawling means we basically have a bunch of URLs that we already know and we start basically having a program which is called Googlebot and it opens basically a browser and it takes one of these URLs from the list and puts it in the browser and then it loads that and then we find some content and then once we have the content from the website, we basically try to figure out what it is about. So in our case, it's like, oh, there's a headline that is about best doggos and puppers online and you have all the cute doggos and puppers of the internet on this page and then there's like a bunch of, of images of dogs and I, there's links to these dogs and then that's new URLs. So we discovered new URLs that we can hand back to crawling. And then we have the cycle that keeps going on. So basically, Googlebot 24-7, 365 or 366 days a year, depending on if it's a, um, a leap year or not. We basically do this. So we crawl a page, we open a page in the browser, basically, this is what Googlebot does. Um, and then we look at what this page is about. And then we basically figure out, so aha, so this page is about dogs and, uh, and it has a link to this other page that is about cats. That's fantastic. Cats. Cool. Yeah. And if you look for like the best dogs online, then hopefully your page is going to be matching that request and you have a descriptive title and a great meta description 
and then we can actually work with that and show that to the user and the user clicks on it and you are happy, the user is happy, the dogs are happy. Fantastic. However, there's this question that keeps popping up. Okay, so it's crawling, but I remember when I wrote a crawler with Python or Ruby or Perl, yes, I'm old, um, I couldn't run JavaScript. I just got like some HTML source code back and then I just like had to deal with that. But does does Google run JavaScript when crawling my pages? And the answer to that is generally yes. But for interesting reasons, we can only do so in a deferred way. Now, what does that mean? Well, the thing is the internet is big. The web is particularly big. So 2016, we crawled 130 trillion pages. That's quite a lot. Now try browsing to 100 trillion pages on your computer. It's going to take a while. And if you have to wait for all the JavaScript to download and parse and execute, it's going to take a lot longer. So we can't all do it in one go. We have to do it one by one and step by step. But that would mean if we would just like make everything slower, that would mean that we would not see a lot of the pages that do not need JavaScript. So that would be unfair to just say like, yeah, we're just going to crawl slower because we have to execute JavaScript and it's just going to take longer. So you know, we're going to see the web. Basically, we're going to update the web or crawl the web in a slower way. That's not what we want to do. We want to have both the best of both worlds. We want to have the pages that do not need JavaScript to be indexed as quickly as possible because it doesn't cost us much. But the other ones where JavaScript is running, ah, those are a little more expensive. So we want to also get them in, but we don't want to get them in on the cost of having everyone else to wait longer. So how do we balance that? Well, the way we balance this is by indexing twice. We have two waves of indexing. So basically what we do, we crawl your page and all the content that you get us gets into the index. And if we then see like, oh, but there's more potentially with JavaScript later when we have the resources. And later can be anything from within minutes to hours to days. So later on, we come back, we render your page using JavaScript. So we execute the JavaScript that is on your page. So JavaScript runs there. And once we are done with that, we get a second round of indexing. So like, okay, now JavaScript has done its thing. There's more content. Let's put that into the index as well. So if your page is empty at the beginning because you all use JavaScript for everything, that's fine. We're like, okay, well, nothing to index yet. And then eventually when we run the JavaScript, we're like, oh yeah, docs and poppers and stuff. Cool. Let's put that into the index. And then we discover the additional links and then we crawl them again. And this is how the cycle goes. But you can help yourself there. If you're like, huh, maybe I can make things faster for the user and also actually give the crawler something that doesn't require JavaScript. If you're using Angular, one way of doing so is using Angular Universal because that is actually a way to fix this problem, to not rely on JavaScript entirely for everything, which is usually a good idea. So this is what our Angular app looked to the crawler and the user, right? So the browser downloads this, it goes like, oh yeah, there's, a, there's an HTML element, it has a dash, so it's a custom element, so I don't know what to do yet. And then I have to download this JavaScript file, it downloads and eventually like runs, and then, uh, okay, it does something. And then there's this JavaScript file, so we have to download that, it's downloaded, it is run, okay, cool. And then finally we get to the application and that makes things appear on screen, which is okay. But as you can see, there was a bunch of, I have to download this and wait. With a slow network connection, and if you have been to the keynote this morning from Sam, 60% of the world is still on a 2G connection, and it is spotty. There's lots of places where you have no connection or Li-Fi or, you know, Eva and, and Sam made a, uh, made a point that you want to make sure to not rely on the, on the network too much um, to get your stuff down there quickly. Um, and if you do, don't make that JavaScript, because if, if it's HTML, it can be parsed as it arrives. So this is what we've got so far. Now, what can we do about it? Well, we install some dependencies, uh, and you can check them out on angular.io slash guides slash universal, I think, or just search for Angular Universal. You install a few dependencies um, for your server site. You then change your app module so that you're using the browser module, but with server transitions. That's a very important thing, which allows you to basically run the JavaScript app on your server site and then hydrate 
the, the skeleton that comes out on the other side, the HTML skeleton that you send to the browser, you hydrate that with the JavaScript single page application functionality on top of what the user already got. And then we basically just create a server module, which is a module that loads all the dependencies and prepares our application to be run by a server side uh, environment. And then within your server, for instance, Express, you use the ng, uh, yeah, the ng Express engine and basically run your application on the server side, fetch all the data there and send as much as you can over the wire rather than sending this empty skeleton of, of JavaScript. And this is what you get then. This is the benefit at the end of this process. What you get is you have the content here. You see this is about best doggos and there is a doggo with a certain weird ID and there's an image of that doggo and it's a bloodhound and it says it's a bloodhound, that's fantastic. So we now have the same code. I haven't really changed the code of my Angular application except for the one change with browser module dot with server transitions. That's the only change I did to my, my uh, Angular application. I now get this, right? And that's much better. And that's also probably better for the user. Let's have a look again. Uh, at how we are doing. Oh, look at that. All right, we're still not really at 100, but we're getting better here. Um, accessibility still tops, fantastic. Let's look at the metrics. We're also doing better here. It's 1.5 seconds to the first pane, but the meaningful pane gets quicker as well, and our CPU is, is uh, relaxed quicker. But again, I like to look at what the user sees, because I think that this visual way is much, much better in understanding what's happening. So here we see this is our vanilla application. Gets us to the blue bit a little bit faster. That's okay. So we are losing this one. But then look at that. There's the card with the text. You can't really see it on the screen, but basically this is the text. The name of the dog is there when this one isn't even showing the spinners yet. So this one starts loading here and we are done here with, with loading the, the, uh, the, the text data. We're still loading the images. But while this is starting to load something, this is already loading the images, and then basically here where we have the, the docs first, this is where we've got it here. And this is a glitch that hopefully gets fixed at some point very soon. So ignore that. But basically, you get the, the docs here rather than here, right? So that's, that's actually pretty good. And if we compare that to our original Angular um, implementation, it's not that much, not much different. I mean, here we, we get some stuff already, but he, again, we have the docs here rather than here. Well, if we, if we count the complete set of images, then this is where we get the complete set of images versus here. So that's quite a distance. And that's like a few, that's maybe like a second or, or, uh, or one and a half seconds um, advantage. So our users get our content faster, which is great because I don't want to sit in front of a loading spinner. I want the content, I want the doggos. So the faster you get me the doggos, the happier I will be. And the same goes for crawlers. Crawlers are like, well, yeah, this page is pretty quick. So, you know, fantastic, yeah. Let's put this in the index already. It's not gonna help you with ranking. It's not gonna be like, oh yeah, you're, well, speed, how fast your site is, that might help you with ranking. What doesn't help you with ranking is if your content is depending on JavaScript or not. So if someone says like, oh, you're using JavaScript, you're not gonna be found, that's not true. What they might mean, but miscommunicate there, is you are in the second wave of indexing. You have to wait until your stuff is rendered. Versus now, our content gets into the first stage of indexing. So our content, if we change it, it will update in, in uh, Google search quicker. We're gonna find it quicker. So that's, that's useful, but it doesn't mean that necessarily we're gonna rank you better or worse for it. There's another trick, so. I have been describing the happy path, and that's something that you usually do at conferences because I only have so much time to, do, to use here. Mm. If you can't run Node.js in production, or if you can't change your server infrastructure uh, in order to actually run the Angular application on your server side, that is fine, there is a trick. We introduced this trick at I.O. this year. Uh, John Miller, my, my manager, went on stage together with Tom Greenaway, two wonderful people, a uh, great talk as well. And they talked about how you can use dynamic rendering to fix this. We haven't really put out documentation back then. We only put out the documentation um, two weeks ago. So dynamic rendering basically means if a browser comes to your server, you're like, wow, this is a normal user, this is a browser. I, I don't know how I could make the server-side rendering right and look good and look fa and like be fast and look good. So what I can do instead is I just give like the normal single page application uh, to render in the browser back. So like, you know, 
have some JavaScript, run it, have a good time. But if a crawler comes in, and some crawlers do not execute JavaScript, so I, I can only speak, so we have seen how Googlebot does it. I don't know how Bing does it, I don't know how uh, Ask does it, or Yahoo does it, or Facebook, or Twitter. So if you wanna put stuff on Twitter or Facebook, they're gonna crawl your page as well to like get the images and the descriptions and all that. They're not gonna run JavaScript right now. They might in the future, but they do not do today. So if a crawler comes, and you don't know if this crawler can do JavaScript or cannot do JavaScript, you're like, okay, look, this crawler will not get the full really cool and like all the animations and stuff, but they don't really care about that anyways. They care about the content that I have there. So I put this into a renderer, and there are a few solutions for this. There's Puppeteer, which is a pretty low level version. Uh, there's Rendertron, which is a more higher level project. There's prerender.io. There's many options to actually do this. So basically I give that to a renderer that then produces static HTML and gives that static HTML back to the crawler. So that's one way of doing it. This has the advantage that you don't have to worry about like, oh, what's gonna, what's gonna be the thing that I'm gonna give to my user? What if my server-side rendering is not fully you know, right yet? You limit that to the crawlers that really need your help there. Um, for Googlebot, that's kind of a workaround, so we hope that we are being not in this position that we have to tell you this anymore in very soon, okay? Um, but right now, that's the situation. So you can use dynamic rendering as a workaround um, to get back into the first wave of indexing or to support crawlers that do not run JavaScript at all or only run a very subset. A thing that a lot of people don't know is, for instance, when I say run JavaScript, Googlebot runs a Chrome 41. That is from 2015. ES6? Not really. Right? Uh, there's a bunch of limitations. If you're interested in the limitations, you can go to developers.google.com and go to search um, and look for rendering on Google. We have a, like a guide that explains how we are rendering and what we render and what we do not render. Also, if you think we are missing documentation, please let me know. Um, I'm happy to, to have a look at it. Please don't talk to me about that. Please put that on Twitter or something because then I have written evidence that I'm not making this up. Okay, cool. So dynamic rendering is one way of making this happen. Um, and there's one more thing that I wanna talk about before I get kicked off the stage, uh, which is Search Console. It's another great tool to help you debug and, and fix problems quickly. So it shows you how you're doing in general. So here we see like this page has a few errors that we wanna have a look at. The few pages are just doing fine. A bunch of pages are not in the index. That's all right. Not being in the index means you can't be found. Um, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Like if you have lots of member pages that you shouldn't be finding on the internet, then that's perfectly fine. So these might be like private pages or something that happen to be exposed to the internet, but we're not crawling them, we're not putting them in the index. It also gives you uh, a tool where you can put a URL on your website, and basically you get a, a feedback, this URL is on Google, it's gonna be fine, we have crawled it yesterday, all cool, it is mobile friendly, noise. This is called the URL inspection tool. We also have the opportunity to send you emails. So you have to verify for your page, and then we associate your, your uh, sorry, domain. We associate your website, your domain, with someone. And that can be multiple users. You don't have to do it alone. You can get half of your team on it, for instance, or your manager or something. Um, and if there's any problems, we're gonna email you. So you don't have to go to Search Console and check it every day. We're gonna tell you what's wrong. We also have lots of more things, like if you're using AMP pages, we have information for that. Um, if you're having issues with your robots.txt, a bunch of stuff is in Search Console already. And uh, you can get it for free at g.co slash search console. And I hope that you're at least nudging someone in your organization to verify for Search Console, because this tool is basically your one-stop shop for all sorts of things that concern technical SEO, page performance, you get analytics on what people are searching for and which, which search results they are clicking on to your page and all that kind of stuff. So definitely have a look at this. This is a great debugging tool as well. And there's more coming, so stay tuned. If you are at Chrome Dev Summit, definitely stay tuned for the day one talk that I'm doing together with Tom because we're gonna introduce a new feature from Search Console. With that, I'd like to thank you for your time and I hope that you're building better websites now and make them faster and make your users more happy and let them discover what you've built more quickly. Thank you very much.